It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box, the show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Gessman, coming to you on a Tuesday, February 16th. That's right, a Tuesday and not a Monday. It feels weird to say. It feels even more weird to sort of live it, but uh, I was busy this weekend, so instead of a Monday show, you get a Tuesday show. A lot of stuff to get through. A lot of MLS updates. Update on the season starting, update on transfer windows, uh, the under-22 acquisition tool, which I know everybody has been screaming and begging me for uh, for quite quite a long time. Now we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, and then, of course, we have some LA Galaxy updates as they've signed a player. It looks like they're going to sign another player. Some other rumors, Christian Pavone included as well. A lot to get to, a lot of things to talk about. In order to help me do all of that is the man himself, Mr. Kevin Baxter. Kev, how's it going, buddy? All right. You know, a lot of people don't know the reason we didn't record yesterday is you had to fly to Colorado and back all, all in one day. And all I can think is, man, your arms must be tired. They, they're very, you know what? My arms are tired. My back, my back, uh, my back hurts. Uh, everything is, is, is sort of exactly as you'd expect it. Uh, whenever I go visit my kid in Colorado, I always have to go. Um, we, we actually wanted to, to, to bring him out here. Um, and so, uh, I flew there on Thursday morning, basically, uh, picked him up after school. Um, and then we flew back that night. And so got that all done. And then, uh, we hung out here at the house, didn't go anywhere, obviously didn't do anything, trying to, trying to stick to the quarantine rules as much as possible with all that. Uh, got to go outside and play a little bit. And then on Monday morning uh, around 11 30 a.m i was able to then fly back to denver uh, and then i got to stick around at the airport because there were no really good connecting flights that got me back to orange county until about the uh the 7 45 p.m one so i walked every single gate at uh, denver uh international airport there looking for big airplanes which i only found two of um and then basically my flight was late i didn't get in until about 11 p.m last night and so yeah that was that was great and my dog is sick so i didn't sleep it's it's been a whirlwind of a time well, you know that I, the Denver airport's big, but you got to go down to where the little planes are. That's the only Starbucks there. Although that Elway place is is not bad, and then there's a couple of Mexican places up on the second level. Yeah, and, and that, that are not bad. You're of course talking about the B concourse, which I could tell you all about and talk about for a very long time. But that is that is the B concourse, and so normally I'm on the C concourse out of Southwest. So I walked all the gates on A. And then went on B. And if you're wondering what big airplanes I found, I found a 777 that was going to Chicago Midway. Uh, so a Boeing 777. And then a 787 that was going to Frankfurt, the only international flight that I could find. And I was really tempted to get on it and never come back. There was, just, there was a piece of me that was like, now nah, let's go. This is, this is my chance. Well, I usually, I mean, I think I was talking about, I usually fly into Stapleton when I go there now. <laughs> yeah, I was going <laughs> to. Hey, but man, you know, I, this is more proof that Patos can fly. I was going to say, let's talk about Pato a little bit. Let's talk about that particular thing to start things off with, because I feel like I have to remind everybody. Good segue. I, I, it was, you, you teed it up. I just hit it out of the park. Um, I have to talk about pa the nickname, the nickname Pato. And, and of course, Kevin, you know, and I know that I got the Pato nickname for one reason and one reason only. Um, and of course, everybody has sort of been, you know, ribbing me talking about how Pato, the actual player, uh, who once responded to an Instagram post of uh, that somebody put out of of me and a Photoshop 
image of myself and Pato next to each other. Um, but uh, this Pato is going to Orlando City. We know that. They posted the picture of the silhouette of the duck, which, by the way, bravo, bravo, very nice. Um, that, And then everybody's like, oh, no, Josh, what are you going to do? You're going to have to change your nickname now that Pato is going to Orlando City. I didn't get, Kevin, you know this, I didn't get the Pato nickname because I like Pato. That was not what this was about. All right, I got the Pato nickname because people wouldn't stop asking me about Pato commenting on the LA Galaxy social media posts. And I said, stop it. Stop asking me about Pato. I don't want to hear another word about Pato. So, of course, then I was deemed and given the name Pato. I thought it was Pato's an alliteration list. to go with Panda. Panda yeah. Pato. I mean, I, that was the deal. It did work that way. Yeah, it did. But that was not the original plan on that. So, um, for all of those asking what I'm going to be changing my nickname to, uh, it will be it will not be changed because nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, Pato has just gotten closer, and I've just been asked about him more. And so, annoyingly enough, I, I actually have seen a rise in the Pato ness, not a decrease that I was hoping to see once he planted his his little duck feet firmly, you know, in the Orlando City. It, it's um, all Pato soup at this point. <laughs> it's all bad duck soup. Is that a thing? Duck, yeah, I guess duck soup is a thing. Um, I was going to say, I think I've mentioned this before. You know my nicknames. Uh, my nicknames have always... My the last ones, names... The ones we can say on the air or, or, or the other ones? Yeah, no, no the, the ones we can say. That. My oh, nicknames... Okay. Uh, my Because my last name is Guessman, and everybody mispronounces that as Gooseman, plus the flying aspect of things always gave me the nickname Goose. So my entire life, my nickname has either been Goose or Pato. Uh, so I've How about apparently the flying Gooseman. I, I, I apparently I've run a foul of, uh, uh, of of the nicknames things. Thank you. I'll do the puns around here. Yeah, I was gonna say. There, there we go. Let's get a little horn in there for that for that one. All right. Um, so anyway, so no, the nickname is not changing, and because of that, we will go ahead. Welcome to Panda and Pato's Morning Zoo. Pato, 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 and Panda. Panda in the morning. Panda and Pato in the morning. All right, glad we got that out of the way. So um, is she going to take Dom Dwyer's place? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is Dom Dwyer, I mean, Dom Dwyer's a free agent, right? Isn't that one of the, he, he could go somewhere and so far he but, hasn't been picked won't. up. But, but won't. <laughs> well, we'll see. There's lots of people who have Wait, who, looser morals than us. If Orlando comes here to play, we got to go introduce you to him. That would be great. Absolutely not. I mean, that's what I said. I said the worst case scenario of all of this, Kevin would be for Pato to come to the LA Galaxy, and then I would have to explain to him why my nickname is Pato is because I don't like the fact that he commented on all of the LA Galaxy posts and everybody would ask me about it. I mean, at this point, you might as well nickname me Pavone because I'm getting sick and tired of the Pavone rumors as well, which we're going to update you on. No, I like the Pato thing, and if you guys were together, I wonder if Pato met Pato, like, then we would transition into a parallel universe or something. Yes, yes, it would spin and start. Let's get on, uh, to some news because we always have those. Some people are like, it took you 10 minutes to start the podcast, man. Why Just you tune to in this to me? 10 minutes late then. That's right. <laughs> you know we're going to mess around for the first couple of minutes at least i got a lot of complaining to do by the way real quickly flying during a pandemic uh is the same as flying oh, yeah you went off on this yes yeah yeah flying during a pandemic is the same as flying without a pandemic except worse uh as you would expect uh there's a lot of uh holier than thou attitudes in there there's a lot it was crowded over the weekend i did not like it at all um i had my mask i had my hand sanitizer i tried to stay away from people as much as possible but the whole attitude the there's this bro attitude out there was like bro i got my mask on i know it's not over my nose bro but it's fine like that's i'm this is good enough i got a mask that's what more do you want like they told me i had to wear one i'm just gonna put it underneath my nose so that type of stuff just drives me crazy so anyway that was that was my fun weekend so you know if you're going on a flight don't uh if you have to go ahead uh wear a mask get your n95 mask which are there are there are a plenty out there um now um and so go get those if, if you're going to travel and try to stay away from people they just stay the pl i know it's southwest but did they give you the peanuts and the drinks or are they still not doing that no, they're not. They they give you water and a snack thing if you want. And I just I didn't know. That's okay. I'll I'll survive. So um, uh, that's probably why I'm dehydrated. All right, update on the season start. Let's get to MLS stuff. Um, we know and and I'm sure you heard announced. And obviously there was no show last Thursday. Um, so we're gonna cover a whole bunch of things and sort of catch everybody up. But the season start date has been pushed basically to April 17th. Uh, we know that the uh, that teams will also have a new reporting date as well. That new reporting date for non CONCACAF Champions League teams is 3-1, all right? So uh, March 1st is that date. If it is a CCL team, which the LA Galaxy are not, uh, that would be February 24th. So they basically get to go, you know, a, a, a little bit earlier, I think a week earlier. Um, however, 
you will have seen that some LA Galaxy players are already there and already training. One of the reasons is if players wanted to go in early, they could undergo basically a seven-day medical protocol, which includes a quarantine and testing and all that stuff. Um, and then that allows them to go do individual training uh, before that 3-1 um, right. light, lighting up. Because the 3-1 reporting is to get all your medical tests and everything done and then a quarantine. Teams are not supposed to – teams will not be on the field – non concacaf teams will not be on the field training as a unit until at least March 8th. So what you're talking about is guys can come in and start that seven-day clock earlier. They could start it maybe next week, perhaps, but they won't be able to train as a full team until March 8th. They'll be able to go out and work individually, maybe maybe in pairs, I don't know. But full team training does not start until March 8th. But there is that, that individual, you know, that, that one-week window ahead of time for all the, the COVID protocols to take effect. Yeah, yeah, and so that's basically what you're going to see as everything sort of starts to ramp up. The other part about this is um, that with the pushback of the start of the league um, to April 17th, there is also a pushback of the primary transfer window for Major League Soccer. The really interesting thing here is, Kevin, if you look between the primary window, which is now going to be from March 10th to June 1st, all right, so 6-1, the transfer window will be open all the way until the very first day of June um, for Major League Soccer, which is a really interesting extension. We'll tell you why perhaps it was brought all the way to June 1st. Um, and then uh, it will pick back up again. So it's it's closed June 1st, and it picks back up again July 7th, Kevin. So you, you have a little more than a month where you can't sign players, and then you're going to be able to go right back to the market and get those done. Really interesting whenever you realize that uh, that contracts are going to come closed for most European or world leagues on June 30th, um, which is why the July 7th date makes sense because people will start to go to go ahead and line up those transfers um, and make those happen. But the June 1st one and the closing of June 1st is particularly interesting for teams that have loaned out players on short-term loans. And Sam Steschko from The Athletic was, was on top of this um, and talking about why this was important to those teams is basically... If the window closed before those loans came up, Kevin, they wouldn't be able to register those guys and get them back until that secondary window opened up in July. So guys like, you know, uh, Jordan Morris um, and then Paul Ariola, I think, is is over as well, or uh, or DK is, uh, is is over in Europe. They wouldn't be able to come back until July. Well, now there's a good chance that those short ter short term European loans, those those UK loans, they'll be able to get them back in and on their teams prior to that June 1st closing, because basically a window has to be open in order to re-register them with the team. So I thought that was a, a, an interesting little thing there. And by the way, if, if the listeners out there don't uh, subscribe to The Athletic, their MLS coverage is excellent. And uh, they, they really go in depth on some of the stuff that is, you know, and they explain it clearly. Some of the stuff that maybe is a little bit off into the weeds and a little bit inside baseball, um, you know, they do a, a pretty good job of following and explaining it. Uh, one thing when you're talking about the schedule and all that, you, you know, the uh, all the player movement machinations and stuff, uh, before I forget, I wanted to say I did talk to Dennis DeCloso this week, and we talked about a number of different things. But one thing that he mentioned to me, and, and I know you've talked about it, we've talked about it on the show, with the, the schedule being moved back again, um, you know, to April 17th, Dennis did say that he anticipates an awful lot of midweek games on a, on a fairly regular basis. You know, we'll go back to sort of as it was last last year uh, when they uh, condensed the schedule. Uh, a lot of weeks with maybe two or three games in, in an eight-day period, and that'll be a fr pretty regular thing. And, and Dennis talked about how that's going to affect the way he puts his team together. You know, you have to have a little bit of depth, and you have to have guys, you know, with stamina and guys that are versatile. You know, maybe you play a guy outside back one week, and then at the wing, uh, a winger in the second game during a week, uh, just you know, to 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 sort of keep him fresh, you give him a, a game at outside back where he didn't have to run too much, and then a game on the wing where he does. So anyway, that, that was interesting. It's the first confirmation I heard uh, of what seems to be a pretty obvious, uh, um, uh, you know. The, concession to these schedule being pushed back is that there will be again once uh once again a lot of midweek games because they are going to play 34 this year yeah i mean you know originally they were supposed to start what at the at the beginning of uh of march was that whenever they said they were actually yeah. gonna yeah and, and this is the latest start ever by the way you, you know last year was the latest finish december 12th latest uh, mls season ever finished this year december 11th so pretty close but this by far is the latest start i don't think they've ever even started a season in april 
much less the middle of April. Yeah, it's uh, it, again, I think there's a lot of things going into that. We talked about it last time. There's uh, there's COVID concerns there. There's also making sure all the teams are, are ready for this season after a little bit of delay. But certainly that delay was not enough for the with the CBA was not enough to push it where they pushed it. I think they well, pushed it for, for COVID reasons. Well, yeah. And, 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 you know, speaking of COVID, we've seen with the NHL already, uh, there will be uh games that will be affected by COVID. I mean, I know the numbers are coming down. We don't know what's going to happen with the the additional, um, um, you know, strains that are coming in from South Africa and the UK and Brazil. But my, I would be stunned if MLS is able to make it through the season without some COVID issues. Now, whether it's, hey, you know, Team A is missing two players, they're going to go ahead and play anyways, or do you have quarantine those teams? Um, you know, the, the prospect of having to reschedule games, uh, you know, I think that looms large and on this and maybe that's another reason why we haven't got the schedules yet uh, as right. you know uh, we're talking about an opening date and a finishing date we don't know who's going to play uh, right. against who when yeah you know it's yeah i know schedule uh, every press release with mls says schedules will be announced soon sometime in the I think there, I think what's hanging things up is the Canadian thing and I talked to Greg Vanny today and we didn't talk specifically about that but he talked about his family are still in Toronto and the the covid protocols there are much different he's actually it's strange he said he wants to get his kids here because they're very active and he wants to get them outside playing again uh, and getting involved in sports and apparently they can't do that in Toronto that the the covid uh, protocols are much stricter there but that's one of the things hanging it up you know there are three canadian teams they need to come down and play here right now they can't cross the border there is a ban on non-essential traffic across the border right. it expires february 21st so we'll see what happens after that but i'm pretty sure that's what's holding things up trying to schedule the canadian teams and deciding whether they're going to have to come down here and start the season in the u.s they finished the season in the u.s last year whether they're going to have to start the season in the u.s this year until until they're able to go across the border freely you know, a listener uh, asked me a question today. I didn't know the answer to. I'll ask you, and I have a feeling your your sort of sense is going to be the same as mine. But they said, you know, are some of the colder weather teams, and certainly with a, a cold streak down the middle of the country and and up at the corners, uh, especially for our friends down in Texas, we have a, a I think at least one listener for sure in Texas, and I know we have uh, a listener who's in our Discord uh, who said his power has been on and off uh, for the last uh, day or two for like fifteen minutes or five minutes at a time. It's been uh, been a little sketchy there certainly in texas and a, and a lot of different things but um they asked they said hey are some any of the cold weather teams coming down to southern california like they normally do to train before the season um you know to sort of get in that that warm weather and i said i would i go i haven't heard anything i said but i it's i, I would find it unlikely that they would come down with the, uh, sort of the strict uh as strict as california has been with sports teams and other things i said but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they're headed to Florida or if they're headed to Arizona um, in some of those places and possibly even Texas um, where things are a little more open uh, for better or for worse. And that may be, but I, I would imagine that some of the cold weather teams do need to get out of their home markets and travel somewhere where they can actually, you know, sort of work and, and, and be warm while they train. Well, if they're going to Texas, I think that's probably a bad idea right now. And, and kudos to those people in Texas using, you know, turning their heaters off and using a little bit of power to listen to our podcast. That's that's <laughs> remarkable. Um, I have not heard of any teams traveling, but I think you're right. I mean, I think if they go anywhere, it's probably Arizona and Florida. Those states are both open for Major League Baseball right now. But there's a lot more uh, to it than that. I mean, they have to go there. They're probably, um, you know, I know some of the baseball teams have had to quarantines. So they would have maybe the, when they report for their seven day quarantine, maybe they report there. Right. Um, so, it, it, you know, I hadn't thought about that, but that's absolutely true that the ability for a team. And, and remember, you just traveled to Colorado and back and and there were some things that you had to go through. But if you take an entire team with the staff and then you have to put them in a hotel um, and you have to follow these strict MLS protocols, um, that could be pretty tough. I, I, but I'm with you. I have not heard anything. I would think that some of those teams would need to get out of their environments. But then, at the same token, you know, if you can, certainly the California teams and the Florida teams, um, you know, they get if they can stay in their home markets, um, that's so much the better because of the quarantine. I know Austin would be a very interesting team to follow because I'm right. sure that when they put their plan together, they thought, hey, we can train in 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 February and March in Austin. That's not going to be a problem. And now. What do they do now? 
I mean, well, I know I the, mean, the snow is going to lift, but for right yeah, now, I mean, they're the, they're the ice and everything. I mean, that's yeah, that seems to be a temporary thing. So I wouldn't expect that those, you know, that Houston, Dallas, Austin, that those guys are going to go anywhere. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, for the traditional, I mean, look at Seattle, Seattle or like a team like Real Salt Lake, who usually trains down here in, yeah, I mean, who usually trains in Southern California. You have Minneapolis, you have Portland, who usually tries to go somewhere a little bit warmer. Um, so, you know, New England, New York City, uh, the Red Bulls, there's a lot of teams in cold weather trying to come down um, and usually train in warmer weather. So we'll see if that's that's even a thing. Again, uh, an interesting thing. It was a good question by, by the listener, um, and it's one I did not have an answer for. So I think that was in the Discord. Did, did you see AJ De La Garza's, uh tweets where he, you know, he's played his whole life in L.A., then Houston, then Miami, gets traded to New England or signs with New England. He had some uh, SOSs on social media the other day of where do I get buy a winter jacket? How can I get snow boots? What <laughs> what about mittens? What kind of mittens should I get? Just completely right. clueless on what's going on up there. Right. No, it was uh, it was funny. AJ, AJ was like, okay, but uh, you guys are telling me to go to LL Bean. We're gonna we're gonna go to LL Bean. I think that was the one that ended up winning out. Yeah, it was uh, it was very interesting on that. All right, let's get to uh, the last bit of MLS news that I sort of wanted to cover, and this is an important one. We've been. People ask me about this probably once every couple of weeks and have ever since the CBA got ratified last year um, to talk about basically what they're calling the MLS under 22 initiative, right? And we heard some outlines for what this initiative would be, and it sounds exciting, but we didn't know rules. We didn't know any of the particulars, and MLS seemed to be hesitant to sort of enact that. Um, however, it does seem that that is an, going to be enacted this year, um, and it does seem like the uh, the players, and or it does seem like we actually have some rules that go with this under-22 initiative. This is different than a young DP OK, this is the, the young DP rules are defined um, in the designated players. And it talks about a player, I think, who's under 23 and basically the cap hit isn't as much um, and they have to sign them, you know, at a certain age. And that young DP tag stays until they they graduate basically into an older one. This is different than that. Um, the U22 player initiative really could change a lot of things and how they go. And it's a little bit of a cross between a designated player and. And it's a cross between sort of a young designated player uh, whenever you look at it. But it should give MLS teams um, the chance to go after young sort of maybe more raw talent uh, that isn't being utilized or is being utilized and has a high upside um, and gets them into the league. And it sort of offsets any cap hit that they come with. So here's some of the rules that we know. And again, the athletic was all over this. Sam Stresko was all over it. And now I know a lot of people were reporting it. Um, but uh, basically, to be eligible, let's start with, to be eligible for this, the player cannot turn 23 in the first season of the contract, right? So you can't sign somebody who's going to turn 23 anytime during that first year of the contract. Basically, they have to be 21, um, and that means that they have to be 21, and they can turn 22 during that first year, but they can't turn 23 during that. So understand that's the age group that you're looking at. They can stay under the U22 initiative until they turn 25. So you get some time with this player. Let's say you signed a 21-year-old, Kevin. You basically have you know four-plus years uh, until they turn 25 uh, to be able to use them in this U22 initiative. Homegrown players and draftees, so players from MLS draft, um, are also eligible for this tag. So it's not just about international. Uh, it can be a whole bunch of different things uh, whenever you look at it. Now, um, here's the, the other parameters here. Uh, some teams... Uh, teams that want to do this can sign up to three players under that rule um, and unlimited acquisition costs. This is the big deal. The unlimited acquisition costs means that you could pay a hundred million dollars to sign somebody who's 21 years old, basically, uh, and put them on your team. You could pay the transfer fee of a hundred million dollars. Now, the salary isn't gonna, you can't pay them, you know, millions and millions of dollars. The salary is actually capped at what the max budget charge is, and then just figure it's six hundred and fifty thousand for this year. Um, you look at that and say, okay, so six hundred. You could pay somebody six hundred fifty thousand. That usually means you're not gonna buy somebody for twenty million dollars and pay them, you know, just six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, basically under it. But there is an advantage to plan, paying them. You can pay them up to the six fifty, and then. The cap hit for those players is somewhere between one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars, roughly that. So that means that you can um, you're not taking the full hit of the salary, and you don't even have to account for 
the transfer fees. Does does any of that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it means the Galaxy could go out and sign Kylian Mbappe this year. Um, he is not going to turn 23 until after the season. So if they want to go out and get Kylian Mbappe and pay him $650,000, um, they could do that. I mean, they could pay that transfer fee. Same with, with uh, Phil Foden from Manchester United or Manchester City, rather. Um, oh, big uh, oh, mistake. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, go ahead, continue. Uh, but here's what I don't like about it. I mean, it, it, it essentially is we, we, with transfer fees in, in terms of the transfer fees. Yeah, it, it gives you the ability to have essentially six DPs. But I don't like that salary rule, though. And when you think back about some of the young players that have come in, you think about uh, Atlanta United with Miguel Amaron and Ezekiel Barco. They both came in, uh, un they would have come in under that 22-year-old, uh, um, uh, um, you know, bar. And, and you could bring them in and, and their transfer fees and stuff would fit under that. But then you're limited in, into what you, you can pay them. And, and so while on one hand, I think it's a good thing, the idea of paying, as you just pointed out, the idea of paying an uh, unlimited transfer fee and then being limited to $650,000 in salary, I can't think of too many players that are going to fit that. If you're paying $20 million in the transfer fee and six fifty dollars in salary, that doesn't make sense. To me, it looks like another way MLS is trying to limit, it, limit the open market, limit the salaries that can be paid to these players. Um, certainly, they're trying to limit the payrolls. I get that. But it, it, isn't it almost self-defeating the idea of, look, we're going to save the own, we're not going to have the NASL model where you pay George Best a bajillion dollars and bankrupt the entire league. We're going to limit this with a salary cap, but now we're allowing teams to pay the transfer fee, uh, whatever they want, unlimited transfer fee, but limit salaries. You're really not preventing, you're really not saving the teams from overspending, are you? Because if they can pay an unlimited transfer fee, they will. The guy who gets hurt here is the player because yeah, he's but, limited but, to what he can make. Yeah, but this is soccer, right? So the guy who the guy who you're going to go after, let's say you're going after Mbappe, Mbappe is not coming because he doesn't want to make six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's not going to happen. So well, why have I mean, the unlimited transfer fee? That's what because, I don't understand. If, if well, you're not I mean, going, it's, under, it's if not an not, unlimited transfer fee. It's just that the transfer fees do, don't count towards the acquisition costs. So, yes, we can joke and say, technically speaking, you could spend $100 million. But again, the player you're going to find for a $100 million transfer fee that's going to come pay for six, play for $650,000 does not exist. Right. So, it's, it, that's, it's, that, so I think they're, it's like they're identifying two kinds of two classes of players and putting them together. And and the, the two things don't don't go together now. But but they do go together. Here's here's my pushback on this is they do go together because there is clearly what they think is a player that you may pay a million and a half dollars for or a player that you may pay a transfer fee of two million dollars that would have put them in either a designated player situation or in a targeted allocation money system. But there's some risk here because they're young that you can now come in and say, OK, well, we spent, you know, two and a half, three million dollars on a transfer fee and we can afford to pay this guy 650, which is, by the way, probably twice as much as he was getting somewhere else because we see a future the whole idea of this is to get young talent into the league and then have it be flipped that's what this is this is a, this is a flip for for and and these guys are probably the guys who are going to fit into this are either going to be a making the same amount of money or a little bit more or considerable more amount of money than where they were um, I don't think you're going to go over to Europe and find, at least not in the, any of the big leagues, and grab guys there and make them part of this deal. It, it's probably going to be from some of the more uh, developing leagues. I, I certainly think, and, and people have pointed this out, looking at South America and Central America is certainly one of those places. I mean, the English Premier League is mining that now, and MLS has dipped its toe in, really has sort of embraced, you know, the sort of Central and South Americans and bringing those up here. That's who they're going. That's who's going to be here for. So, in in my mind, I think you're probably going to end up finding that the guys that are going to be signed are going to be making more money than they were making, so they're happy, and the teams are going to be happy because those transfer fees aren't going to be hit and tacked onto the salary caps, and the salary cap number can still stay low. I mean, this is this seems like it's in my mind, and and you can have a different opinion, but in my mind, this is a good deal for both the player and the league, and if MLS wants to be a selling league and a developmental league, which they claim to be, then this seems like it's a it's a good place to do it, and you basically could get three very good players, um, young players, raw players who are on you know any given MLS team. You know, you make a good point about the uh, ability to be able to flip some of these players, so this uh, MLS sort of becomes a transit point, and and maybe that's a good strategy now to to sort of pump some money into the league. But when you look at talent, and, and I'm not arguing for this because I think these players 
are much better off going to Europe and it's much better off for the national team. But when you look at this, this whole exodus of very young talent that's gone to the Bundesliga and, and to um, Portugal and well, all over Europe to uh, the Serie A now, all these young players like Chris Richards and, and Matthew Hoppe and some of these players, you know, should they stay in MLS? Probably not. Probably they're going to develop better over there. But but these are the kind of players they're talking about with this it, under 22 class. Um, these are those young players that are that are going to Europe now. You know, U.S. players um, that are not stopping in MLS on their way. They're going straight from youth leagues and maybe in some MLS academies, it goes straight to the Bundesliga. Yeah, and we talk about it. Homegrown, so you can use it. Draft players, you can use this tag on. So technically speaking, you know, somebody like, um, you know, like U Ulianis, who went over, maybe the LA Galaxy could have sweetened a deal and paid him, you know, more money and still not had the cap hit. Basically, if you think about the cap hit part of this, right, you could pay, you could have somebody making six hundred, six hundred thousand dollars plus, Kevin, but you're only paying one hundred and fifty of that is only hitting the cap. So there's a significant amount of change there that you can pay. Now that's still money. You know, we always talk about the cap and the cap is, you know, calculated in many different ways. That's not the overall output of what a team is putting out. The team still has to pay the full amount of whatever, or whatever any of these things are. It's just a matter of how many things hit the cap and how many don't. So when we look at the the, the cap and, and the total spend, um, those are those are different things uh, in terms of the money available and sort of how that all seems to go. So um, for me, I like this. Um, I want to see what it sort of does. I want to see how it fits into the rest of the league. I want to see if the LA Galaxy take advantage of it. I want to see how other teams use it and take advantage of it and twist it to uh, to every little whim that they're sort of looking at. And so we'll see if uh, if that's one of those things that uh, that the LA Galaxy can take advantage of here with Greg Vanny, um, with Dennis DeClosa sort of going forward. Well, if you want to see how the system works and, and what the edge, edge of the envelope is, Look at New England because Bruce Arena is going to find out where the edge of that envelope is. He al he always seems to do that. Let's uh let's get away from MLS news now. Uh, a little LA Galaxy news as well. Now I, I you had a conversations you had conversations today. Let's see. Uh, you talked with Dennis DeClosa not too long ago. Um, I talked to some people around the LA Galaxy today about Christian Pavone. So I can give you an update on that here a little bit later. See, all you all your people are unnamed. You, you I know. talked to some people, and I I I have names of the people I talked to. Yeah, all the, all the people that I. Talked talk to is just they're just cosmo that's it it's, i get all my info from from, from a, a a plush uh space alien of course um no uh so so i know you talked to i have a galaxy source we can talk about it a little bit um but why don't you let's see you talk to jonathan dos santos dennis de Closa, and greg vanny right in in fairly rapid succession here yeah well i talked to chicharito last week and to finish the chicharito story i i talked to uh dennis de Closa, and and i need to get a little bit better at just just talking to Dennis. Whenever I call him up, I always feel like I'm wasting his time and I rush through my questions and he'll inevitably stop me and just start chatting about other things. And, and it uh, seems like he wants to, you know, be friendly and, and uh, I have to get past the thing where I think I'm wasting his time. But, um, you know, he, he did tell me uh, about the Pavone thing. One thing he said about, the, I said, look, the Argentine media is saying this, that, and the other thing. He said, yeah, if you listen to the Argentine media, they had this deal done in November. It's not that complicated. He said they thought it wasn't that complicated, but it is. And I right. know you'll fill us in a little bit on on Pavone. But today uh, I talked to Jonathan Dos Santos in the afternoon and Greg Vanny in the evening. Um, it, it had a really good conversation with Jonathan, and, and his English is coming along really well. Uh, we did the interview in Spanish, but we we chatted a little bit in English. And one of the things I asked him is, you know, he grew up in Mexico and played in Spain. Uh, unlike his brother, never went to England, played in Spain, and then came here. And I said, when did you learn your English? And he said, when I got here. And, if, you know, he's only been here four years, not that long. Um, and he said he learned his English here. And the reason, and it's really good uh, now, and the reason he learned it is he wanted to be the team captain, and he wanted to be able to talk to his teammates. He wanted to be able to joke around with them in the locker room. This wasn't so much giving orders to players on the field or talking to referees. It was just being a friend and being a confidant, being a, a shoulder to lean on or an ear to talk to for his teammates in English. And so, um, you know, he learned English and and I think that kind of shows his devotion to the team. He did talk about the fact that during last season, he wanted to retire. I asked him whether he was really serious about that or frustrated. And he said he was absolutely serious. Um, that the injury was not getting better. The season was was terrible. The team was not playing well. It wasn't fun anymore. And he said he seriously considered retiring. And once he got that out of his mind, he he said he worked hard this off season, probably as hard as he's worked in the past. Sort of what Chicharito said. Right. Um, Den, uh, 
Greg said he's seen both of them around the facility, as you mentioned, both Chicharito and and Jonathan. He said they both look great. They both look like they're really fit. And they're ready to go. Jonah also told me that he has bought, he has a house in West Hollywood. He said he bought it. He's not renting. He wants to stay here when he's done playing. He said he loves Los Angeles, that it's close enough to Mexico where he can be home in a couple of hours to see and his parents can come here. He said Spain was just too far, but he really loves it here. And he talked about, um, you know, it's a, he said it's a Mexican town, uh, but it's in America. And he said whenever he goes out, he gets recognized. And he said, I'll go to a Mexican restaurant, I'll get recognized. I'll go to a Salvadoran restaurant, I'll get recognized. He goes, even if I go to an Italian restaurant, all the busboys are Mexican and they all recognize <laughs> him. So um, he seems like he is in a really good place. And one of the things Greg talked about was, I said, you know, Jonathan's played everywhere. He's been a holding midfielder. He's been a, a, an attacking midfielder. He's been sort of the quarterback. He's been the point guard, bringing the ball up. Um, you know, whatever you want to call him, he's played everywhere. And and Greg said, yeah, he has played everywhere, and he's suffered because of that, mm -hmm. because he's he's had to do a number of different things. He's never got to concentrate or perfect one skill. And he said the Galaxy are trying to sign or trying to acquire a defensive midfielder. And if they do that, they want Jonathan to be that box-to-box -box midfielder that they think he's good at. Even though he's getting older, he said he's not too old yet. Um, he said that he has a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom that he can use. But he wants him to be a box-to-box -box guy. He wants him to get involved in the attack a little bit more. He said in some games, he's going to push all the way into the box and, 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 and try to score. Other games, he's going to sort of be the guy that just brings the ball up and sets people up. He anticipates he's going to get a lot of assists this year. And he likened them a little bit. This was my comparison, but Greg agreed with it. I liked him a little bit. I likened him a little bit to Michael Bradley earlier in his career, not the Michael Bradley that Greg Vanny had the last couple of years, but the early Michael Bradley under his dad with the national team when he was um, not quite an attacking midfielder, but a guy who got involved much more in the attack. And so he sees a new role for Jonathan. Both Jonathan and Greg Vanny did talk about one of the problems the Galaxy have had is uh, a lack of continuity that, you know, Jonathan's been here four years. He's gone through four coaches. Right. Um, and Greg Vanny talked about that. And I said, how, how do you cure that? You, you, you're you part of the problem if you think about it, you know, right. the continuity. And he said, what I have to do is I have to come in and establish things from day one. This is the way we're going to do things. And he said, and I can't change. We can't get into midseason. And then all of a sudden things aren't working and I change. He said, we have to commit to a, a program. We have to commit to a strategy. We have to commit to a style of play and we have to stick to it. And that's where the continuity will come. And maybe we get off to a slow start, but maybe we turn it around because of that continuity. And so that's, I think, I think you're going to hear a lot from the players and the coaching staff this year, the idea of a plan and sticking to it, trying to get that continuity and not switch things up, which has happened too much in the last four years, I think. Well, well, it's interesting because it, it changes, you know, just to go back to, to sort of talk about Jonathan Dos Santos and where Greg Vanny sees him, but uh, sees him playing, but it changes sort of the the narrative that we've been hearing, um, you know, and, and let me say the, the rumors that we've been hearing, not necessarily what has actually been happening with the LA Galaxy um, in terms of what position they're targeting. And if they're targeting a defensive midfielder, which I believe that they are, um, and looking at Jonathan Dos Santos um, as sort of that that cam, that central attacking midfielder, being more offensive, even box to box as a central midfielder, um, you can see Jonathan Dos Santos fit in there and you can see a need for a defensive midfielder. That makes sense. The other part of that that makes sense is that uh, talking to a Galaxy source earlier, I had told you that the LA Galaxy had several targets in mind, sort of not only in that central attacking midfielder role, but somebody who is versatile, right? Somebody who can play on the wings, somebody who can play forward, somebody who can play in the middle as well. And if you go and you match those things together, they don't collide with each other, Kevin. That makes sense. You're stringing things together. We're connecting dots here. Uh, that the LA Galaxy are looking probably for more of a winger than they are really a, a dedicated central attacking midfielder if they think Jonathan Dos Santos can fit in there and if they're you know looking for a defensive midfielder. Well, uh, and, and I know you want to talk about Oriel Fisher, but, but that's where he fits into this thing too. Again, going back to what we talked about, a lot of midweek games, compacted schedule, tons of international stuff this this uh, year. Look at just uh, Julian Araujo. He's probably going to go to the Olympic trials um, uh, in March. He's probably going to go to the Olympic Games if they happen as a U23 player. He's probably going to be on that Gold Cup team because I, I don't think Greg Berhalter is going to call his A team up for that Gold Cup. So he's going to be there. And he could be in the mix for, at least for camp, for the eight 
World Cup qualifier. So here's one right. of your, your starters. He's going to miss a ton of time. And we know we're going to have those midweek games and all those kind of things. So a guy like uh, Oriel Fisher, he could play both. O'Neill. O'Neill Fisher. O'Neill. I'm sorry. Yeah, this o guy. Yeah, I'm looking at it here. It looks like an R. Uh, yes. Yeah, O'Neill Fisher, uh, who's a Jamaican international, but he only has 15 caps with Jamaica. So I don't know how much he's going to be called up, how much he's going to be away. But O'Neill Fisher is a guy that can play both outside back positions. He can he can fit in at a wing if he needs to in a pinch. So I see him as a guy who's going to back up Viafania. Maybe uh, when they have three games in eight days, maybe he starts in Viafania's place. Uh, right. When Araujo's a, a, away, he plays right back. When Araujo's here and needs a little bit, and again, I'm not saying right back is an easy position to play, but I think there's a lot less mileage covered than than when he's playing the winger position so maybe maybe you know julian plays right back one day and then fisher goes in front and plays on that wing for that game to give uh you know uh, julian a little bit of a break i think you're going to see a lot of that kind of versatility and the guys they sign now the guys they add to the roster here when camp starts are going to be guys who can play two or three positions if they need to be because with the schedule you're going to need that versatility about o'neill fisher you talked about how a lot of the players from DC United when he, he was not offered a contract. He was let go on, on November 30th. Um, a lot of the DC United players tweeted out uh, congratulations to him and, and and actually told Galaxy players, this is the guy you're going to love. He's apparently a very physical back, very good in the tackle, um, a guy who has a very high work rate, unselfish. Again, exactly the kind of guy you want to play multiple positions, left back one day, right back the next day, maybe play three positions in the same week. Uh, that's the kind of guy I think that uh, the Galaxy think they have in him. Yeah, 29 years old, Jamaican international, like you said, spent 2018 through 2020 with DC United, new signing for the LA Galaxy this week announced on Monday. Um, played 2015, 2017, was drafted by the Seattle Sounders, ended up playing with the Sounders there. Uh, 66 games played, 44 games started, one goal and two assists there. I always love the defenders giving those offensive stats there as well. Um, in 2018, as recently as 2018, uh, Fisher had two caps for Jamaica, played in some the 2017 Gold Cup. Gold Cup. So, um, it, you know, it seems like he's maybe a little bit more of a fringe player for for the reggae boys right now. Um, however. Uh, knowing the LA Galaxy's luck, I wouldn't be surprised if because of different regional tournaments, because of, you know, coronavirus and, and different quarantines, um, you know, he may end up getting called uh, up as well. I don't think that's the case. I think the LA Galaxy probably have a pretty solid grasp and understanding of where he is in the sort of the international game. But uh, again, you're talking about a guy with MLS experience, a guy who knows the league, um, a guy who has really played sort of the backup position uh, for most of his time in Major League Soccer, which is a plus and a minus. Sometimes you need those guys who have a mindset, Kevin, that they understand it's their job to come off the bench. Alan Gordon was that way, right? Alan Gordon knew he was coming off the bench, right? He was, he, yeah, he would start if you needed them to, but really he knew his job was to come in off the bench. Um, and I think, uh, you know, O'Neill Fisher sort of has that mindset, sort of understands what it is. And with Julian Araujo's uh, 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 disciplinary actions uh, that sometimes get in the way of his, his playing time, his yellow cards, his red cards, um, you know, this seems like a pretty, so I, again, this is like a piece to the puzzle, Kevin. It doesn't make your puzzle complete, but it's a really good piece that like sort of helps you fill in a whole bunch of little well, slots. I, I like it because again, when you talk about, you know, Joey Araujo's disciplinary problems and, and the fact he'll be away in the past, in the recent past, the galaxy have been too content to say, we have a starter. We have a, a guy who will start 28 to 30 games and we're going to have a galaxy two guy fill in behind him. And that has really come back to bite them because inevitably there's been injuries or international duty or whatever. I, I you know, I know the defense has given up about 11 million goals over the last four years, but I really like this defense right now. I mean, think about it on, on one, on the left side, you got Via Fania and then Daniela Acosta behind him. We didn't see anything of him last year, but, um, uh, you know, appears to be a very good player, um, you know, in the center of Steris and people and, and Dupuy, um, you know, I think it, there's, it, you know, a, that's a pretty solid trio. Then the other side now, all of a sudden on the right side, we got O'Neill Fisher and, and uh, Julian Araujo. That's a pretty solid defense, uh, you know, yeah. and, and there's depth to it. Um, you know, you have what seven guys for four starting positions, right? Is that right? Um, so it, it's 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 looking pretty good. I mean, I like the way that the defense has come together. Yeah.
Yeah, you were right on seven. I was counting them in my head as you were as you were going. Yeah, I only yes. have uh, five fingers on one hand, so I had to kind of carry the two and, and, and seven. And then the, and then there are Galaxy two guys who who come in there behind there as well. I mean, we should we should talk about you know uh, Jalen Neal and and, and Marcus for, uh, for um are are can be central defenders as well. So I mean, there's a there's some depth there. There is some some good stuff. The the problem with all that comes is it falls apart as soon as you look at the right wing and realize there isn't want anybody, um, at least not somebody who you would dedicate in that position. Now. If if Jonathan Dos Santos is going to play a CM role, then it's likely that Sebastian Legette could slide out and take either the left or the right hand side. So, um, if you, if I mean that's mandatory, if they're going after a defensive midfielder, Kevin, then Jonathan Dos Santos plays in front of him in a more advanced position. It's unlikely you're going to have three guys in the center of the field for no reason whatsoever, unless you just play a straight up three with three, you know, sort of a two stacked. Um, you could do that, but then you're limited sort of on wingers. It, it depends on what formation you go, but it probably means that Sebastian Legette is moves moves out to the side um, on either way. So now, perhaps the LA Galaxy are just looking for a left wing or a right wing, and Sebastian Legette comes in there, or they have some flexibility. They go after somebody like uh, Balich, who we can talk about here in a little bit as well. But um, as it stands right now, the LA Galaxy don't have a backup forward other than, than Zubak. Um, so Zubak is there and that backs up Chicharito. Now Chicharito seems like he's he's playing the right tune and, and doing all the right things that he's supposed to be doing. Um, but whenever you say that, there's always a chance somebody could get injured. So the depth there is not great. And so um, that's that seems to be a problem still. Uh, and then you go into uh, you know right wing, left wing, the depth there. Yes, there's some Galaxy Two guys. Yes, there's some 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 guys there. There's a lot of guys right now on this roster, Kevin, and we're at 24. Currently, I have to say that with uh, with a an asterisk next to it because uh, 24 with uh, O'Neill Fisher coming on there, we're expecting that Carlos Harvey, um, who was on loan last year to Galaxy Two, uh, who now looks like his move is permanent, and the LA Galaxy will be signing him up top. Uh, it looks like uh, he'll be joining as well, so that would be 25 if they sign him. Uh, I heard rumors that there could be another G2 signing that gets called up or, or brought up this week. I don't know if that is Harvey or if it's someone else right now. I ha tend to believe it's somebody else. And so you can look at, at Cuevas, uh, possibly could be that guy, or Augie Williams possibly could be that guy. Um, we'll have to sort of wait and find out for that. Uh, you're starting to fill up a roster, but when I look at this roster, I can see several players on here right now where I'm sitting there going, these, some of these guys are going to be spending time with LA Galaxy too. They may train with the senior team. Um, but quarantine rules, uh, with, you know, sort of notwithstanding, I would expect that they are actually down with, um, with galaxy two. And so, yes, we're about, you know, 25 or 26 out of 30 spots, uh, with no starting left wing or right wing player from sort of what we can see from these different, uh, different, uh, formations that you're playing in your head. I, I still think that there's more room there. So as we fill this up and it gets to 26, you know, Triore is still on this roster right now because he hasn't been officially loaned out yet. So he's still there. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that sort of still have to happen. So I don't want people to panic as we get closer to 30. Uh, things can can change and probably will change uh, when that happens. So uh, well, that's that's where we sit with the roster. Well, I know we don't like to talk about formations and it doesn't really matter because once they kick the ball, everybody runs around anyways. But it's beginning to, you know, and talking to Greg and, and what he's thinking about with a holding midfielder, it's beginning to look like the Galaxy best formation might be like a 4-1-3-2. Maybe, you know, because I, I, I think Chicharito needs a second forward up there with him. I don't think he works well as a lone striker. Um, so, but, but if that's the formation they go with, they still need that holy midfielder. We don't know who that's going to be yet. Um, they still need players on both wings. I think you're right. Legit goes on one wing, probably the right side. Jonah in the middle. If they sign Pavone, does he go on the left wing or does he join Chicharito up top? Do you put Zubik up top? Um, I think you need somebody with their back to the goal, and, you know, to feed Chicharito charging forward. So, um, you know, sort of a, 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 a maybe number nine to sort of hold the ball up a little bit. Um, so, uh, or a false nine. So, you know, there's still some holes to fill. They need to, to make sure they have somebody on the left wing. They need somebody up front with Chicharito. And then they need that holding midfielder. So I can still see it, with Pavone being one of the three, I think they, it looks like they need probably three more starters. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of in that, you know, there's probably six of consequence signings that you have to make still. Um, in, in general terms, there are six 
realistic players who will vie for starting positions um, up to a certain point. And, you know, that that's where the LA Galaxy, I think, are, are, are thin right now. We were told to sort of expect some signings and sort of some things that they had lined up ready to go in the next couple of weeks. So uh, I would imagine that stuff still happens. But of course, until things are signed, until things are 100% done, uh, you, you never know how and when those could go sideways. So um, let's update on Christian Pavon, though, Kevin, because that was, uh, of course, one of the topics of uh, discussion this morning on Twitter, because, you know, it was after a holiday and people didn't get a lot done on Monday. So apparently the, the Twitter machine decided to fire up with more quote unquote reports uh, coming out that, oh, this is Boca's absolutely taking the deal this time. And, you, you know, as you said, you were talking to uh, to 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 Dennis and he was saying, you know, hey, the, the Argentine media has basically said that, uh, you know, this was going to be done in November and it's still not done. Uh, I was talking to a Galaxy source today who was uh, who's who's very well apprised of the situation. Um, and this person was saying, you know, they were sort of jokingly saying, oh, yeah, the, the Pavone, you mean the longest transfer in MLS history? Um, and so, you know, they're aware that this is taking a while. And I think that their patience could be rewarded uh, whenever all this is. But um, basically what is going on right now is the LA Galaxy did submit a recent bid to Boca. So I think we can imagine it's different than the one we talked about uh, maybe a week ago or a week and a half ago. Um, and then that that nothing formal has come from that. They're waiting for Boca to respond. And we've talked about how it's a board that makes these decisions. And that board has to look at this offer and they have to decide what they're going to do. And that's multiple people getting together and deciding what they're going to do. And then they have to tell the president of the club what to do. Um, so it, it's not a quick nor easy um sort of tree of decisions to make in order to get an answer. Uh, the negotiations are ongoing. That's that's all there is to it. So, you know, every time you see a report that is coming out there, just sort of take it with a grain of salt right now. I will do my best to update whenever I see those um, and, and try to... I, I, I consider myself more of a rumor squasher, Kevin, than like a rumor reporter because I feel like all I do is go out there and find out what's actually happening and then report that. And usually it's, you know, not nearly as sensational as what is actually happening. Yeah, well, again, it's it's you know it's just the way international soccer works. First of all, every deal in the in the world, uh, every player in the world is linked to the Galaxy at some point. I've had agents tell me they purposely lie and mislead to the media because they want to have their player's name linked to big clubs. So it's hard to make sense of, out of all this. And it's fine. There are some people that just love to go out and print whatever rumor comes along. Sergio Aguero is coming to the Galaxy. Uh, you know, Angel de Maria is coming to the Galaxy. He leads. He leads. Liga Unen assists. He's not coming to the Galaxy. Um, you know, there's all these things going going on, and and if you don't really care whether it's true or not, you just want a lot of clicks on Twitter, then you you start printing those rumors. But I think it's a disservice to the club and the fans and the player when you do that. So I mean, you're right. Try to figure out what's what's true, what's not. And I think we've done a pretty good job on Pavone by not leaping, uh, you know, to conclusions with every rumor that comes out. But then having said that, having said a lot of this stuff is based on rumors and media reports that are not true, that makes uh, makes me wonder about this uh, court case that right. Pavone is allegedly involved with. Um, the the media in Argentina saying now that the, the woman who has made the claim against Christian Pavone is asking a judge to prevent him from leaving the country. I don't know if if that's true. It, this is a very difficult thing because we're dealing with sexual harassment. Um, it's a very uh, important topic, a very important theme. But at the same token, from what I'm hearing from Galaxy players, is they're not 100% convinced that there is much to this. They they believe, especially since the woman waited, which is not again not people do this on their own time. It's a very uh, emotional thing. It's for some women, it takes them a year or more. To, to be able to get up the courage to to make these charges. But the Galaxy are a little bit concerned that perhaps there's not a lot there there and that uh, this may be a, a borderline extortion thing. They're, they do not appear to be concerned about the legal jeopardy that Pavone may be in or the character issue that comes up whenever these kind of charges are made. Um, the Galaxy are well aware that this could turn out to be another Alexander Katai thing, signing a player with some baggage in his in his closet that that they either were aware of or overlooked. Um, so they, they are following this, but the, what I'm hearing from the Galaxy right now is they are not overly concerned uh, with the sexual harassment charge because they're just not sure that it's 100% true. Well, and sexual assault charge, by the way, not just sexual harassment, right? But I mean, there's, there's, there's a, there's a serious charge here. Here's, here's what I've had to do in, in all of this, uh, because every time I report on the Pavone thing, people ask me about sort of the, the sexual assault charges and, and, and what is going on. 
And all I can say is that for, and I have to echo what you're saying, Kevin, which is the LA Galaxy seem unconcerned. I'm not saying that I'm unconcerned by this. I'm saying that the LA Galaxy are unconcerned. So when we report this rumor, or when we report about the rumors, when we report about you know what is going on and whether the LA Galaxy, are, they are negotiating. Uh, they feel that they have, at least for, for one reason or another, uh, enough information to be able to, to, yes, this is a risk to them, but they think it's a manageable risk. Um, and not something that they're 100%, you know, they feel confident in going forward with Christian Pavone. Um, you know, people ask, you know, well, what happens if it ends up being true and that Pavone ends up, you know, all, all this stuff ends up happening and it all comes down on the LA Galaxy. I mean, the LA Galaxy do have a, I'm sure there will be a morals clause in the contract, so the contract can be broken if that indeed happens. Um, but a lot of times the transfer fees that are paid, those types of things don't go back. Um, maybe there's a deal in the contract, uh, a line in the contract that says that this happens, then, you know, certain monies get refunded or, you know, there's a split or something like that. Um, so there's significant risk going on here. And I, 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 for me, it's a head scratcher, Kevin, as to why it has to be Christian Pavone. I get it. I get what you get with Christian Pavone. I get that you get a, a you know, an MLS MVP type uh, player. And you know that he's an MLS MVP type player because he, he came in here and almost did it. Um, so you look at that and say, well, you know what you're getting you know he can play in MLS. You know he's happy in LA. There's a lot of things in there that if you go get anybody else, um, we're going to talk about Balich. And, and basically, Balich, uh, Hussein Balich, uh, came off the bench and scored again for last. That was my update on Balich. I don't know that the LA Galaxy have advanced talks uh, with Balich. I don't know if that's somebody that they're still targeting. At one point, they were. Um, but looking at all those things... Um, you know, if you bring Balich in as good as he looks right now, Kevin, you don't know how he's going to perform in Major League Soccer. You don't know how he's going to perform in the LA with the LA Galaxy. You don't know how he's going to sort of adapt to life in Los Angeles. And because of all those don't know things, uh, and and for me personally, I don't know how you know the Austrian Bundesliga transfers to MLS in terms of quality. Um, so all of these things being said, there are a lot of unknowns that are knowns with Christian Pavone. Um, but there's a big unknown with Christian Pavone, and it's how this ends up turning around. So for me, I, I think I would have turned my back and walked away from this because it's not worth the risk. The LA Galaxy feel confident in that, and they have more information, I'm sure, than I do. Well, I, I, and I think you're right in a lot of ways, and, and here's why. is that the This is more than money to the Galaxy. Yes, the money is important, and it's a huge factor, but this is the Galaxy. This is, again, the New York Yankees. This is the the model franchise for MLS. And there are sports teams that you can think about, you know, the old Oakland Raiders from the Al Davis years, where sometimes guys with a little bit of a background, actually, those are the kind of players the teams go after. That's not the Galaxy. The Galaxy is Landon Donovan and David Beckham and they're squeaky clean and Kobe Jones and players like that. That's the Galaxy. It's the New York Yankees of soccer. And their reputation is is that is their stock and trade. That is the most important thing. The five MLS championships, all, all the great players that have come through here. One mistake. And that's why, uh, you know, they got rid of Katai. I mean, that was a 48-hour thing. That was a 48-hour controversy and he was gone. Now, Katai is not Pavone. I get that. But the point being is they need to protect that reputation. What happened with Katai and his wife is is it. You can't even hold a candle to to what's going on or what's been charged against or alleged against Pavone. So the Galaxy, it, this is a very difficult situation. Um, if they bring him in and they find out that there's more to this than they thought, uh, it's really going to damage the brand. And and that's why I look at this and say, I don't believe even with Pavone, this team is is probably on the verge of an MLS cap. I think it's a couple of years away at least. So. The risk of bringing in Pavone when he's probably not going to lead you to an MLS Cup anyways, he's not Zlatan, um, is that a gamble worth taking? Do you really want to roll the dice on this? I don't think the Galaxy do that. I, so I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. We know they know way more than you and I combined times 10. Right. But they they seem to feel very confident. and And – they definitely know the risk of getting this wrong. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and um, you know, give them the, a huge benefit for the doubt that they know more about this than, than anybody else. Because otherwise, the risk, it, it just doesn't make any sense at this point. Again, if they were on the verge of an MLS Cup, you could say, yeah. I, maybe, yeah, but I mean, roll I'm, the dice. But but even then, it's a it's a really iffy thing. Yeah, but you're you're you know you're you're shifting morals whenever you even make that comparison, right? No, it's and, like oh, and you you are and you are, but teams do that all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, you absolutely are. 
here's the thing is that if you get this wrong, somebody gets fired um, and somebody's career is, you know, could be over. I mean, Dennis DeClosa is 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 going after this. And again, I'll defer and give Dennis the, the benefit of the doubt, as I think that he somewhat deserves right now. But if this comes back to bite him in the butt, what am I going to sit there and go, oh, tough break, Dennis? It's like, no, you knew this. You knew this was a possibility when you did it. It went against you. Uh, the LA Galaxy now lost, you know, not, have to get rid of Christian Pavone and release him from the contract because that's the only thing they can do to try to save face after they signed him in the first place. Um, you know, so do you sell your soul to the devil on this one when there are other players out there? I'm not saying that they can be as good as Christian Pavone, please. Um, but for me, it's a risk that I'm not sure I would take. You'd have to have a lot of really good information, and I'll assume that the LA Galaxy have that. I have no problems with that. I'm going to assume they have it, Kevin. But if it goes sideways, if it goes wrong, there's, there's no, oh, well, I didn't know. There's well, and, th that, that can't be it. And here's another thing. I've seen a lot on social media where Galaxy supporters are saying, we should walk away from Favone. And I think that says an awful lot about the Galaxy, the organization, and their supporters. I can't think of, uh, on one hand, I can't think of a number of teams where their supporters would say, oh, a potential league MVP, but he's got some background, uh, some problems in his background. Well, let's take a shot. No, uh, Galaxy supporters are, are by and large saying this is a – a risk that we don't need to take. Let's let the guy go. We don't want to have a guy with that kind of cloud over his head on our team. And man, that is a that is a testament to to this franchise and what they've built. And so again, I'll go back. Dennis Dennis, as much as anybody we know, is a, lives on social media. He reads all this stuff. He knows what people are saying. So again, um, if he continue, if he's continuing to negotiate, um, Either he is a, 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 a guy you don't want to play 21 with because he's a big gambler or he knows uh, that uh, it's a safe bet. Life is a gamble, Mr. Kevin Baxter. Life is a gamble. Yeah, right. No one to hold him and when, no one to fold him. Somebody famous said that once. Maybe even sung a song about it. Um, all right. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of where we stand. I, I think that you're going to see some additional roster moves coming this week. Um, the Carlos Harvey we talked about, I, I think there might be one more. I don't know if it gets done this week or if that happens next week. Uh, we had talked about possibly five to nine additions um, at one point. And again, I can see this going over 30 on the roster. I don't think that freaks anybody out. There's going to be a lot of people in camp to sort of uh, try to figure this out and get this going. But, you know, clock's ticking. Um, April 17th isn't that far away. You know, March 1st isn't that far away. You got a couple weeks until March 1st, really, and March 8th, uh, whenever people start training. So, you know, yeah, you have times. The transfer window open till June 1st. That's a huge, so, I mean, you know, you can add all the way into the season. So, so look for that as well. And if you remember before the pandemic shut everything down, um, the LA Galaxy seemed like they were close and we're going to add in that, in that extended, uh, primary transfer window, um, all the way into it. And then, Everything got shut down and, and sort of slid away. So uh, that's where we sit with the LA Galaxy currently. Uh, 24 players on the roster. Uh, side note there that that doesn't include Carlos Harvey, that it does include right now Didi Troy, who is on loan. So uh, 24 of 30 spots filled. Doesn't count the two MLS draft picks that, are, uh, that will be in camp as well, probably. So uh, a lot of stuff to get to still. A lot of things to cover before the season actually kicks off. But getting closer every day. Um, as we move forward. All right, uh, Kevin, anything else you want to get yeah, to? Yeah, I want to ask you one question. The schedules are not out yet, as we've talked about ad nauseum. But July 4th this year is a Sunday. And you know the Galaxy had been home every every uh, July 4th since the franchise started, and they have the big fireworks show. Not expected to have fans in the stadiums until late uh, summer, early fall. Do you still think the Galaxy have a Sunday, July 4th home game, just in case fans are allowed? It? Do they keep yes. that going just for momentum's sake? Yes, they do. And the fact that nobody got out at the center circle last year whenever they weren't playing games uh, and, you know, held up a sparkler to keep the fireworks uh, streak going is still very well, disconcerting were, to my heart. They were, in, they were in Florida, though. Yeah, I don't care. You could have okay. had anybody go stand at center circle. You could have had Cosmo with a sparkler standing there waving it above, you know, Cosmo's head and saying, here we go. We had the fireworks on July 4th again. They already, so as far as I'm concerned, they already screwed that up last year. Um, this year... Uh, let's see. I, I, it was funny because I, I remember there was going to be a really big July 4th celebration that, that last, that last in 2020 as well, because they had like lasers and they had lights and like the lights in the stadium, the lasers in the stadium were going to sync up with the fireworks. It was going to be a big thing. Uh, nope, not even Cosmo with the sparkler. So that streak died. Whenever they tell you about the fireworks streak, just remember 
They're lying now because well, they missed that one July 4th. But if yes, they, if they do it and we're in the stadium alone again like we were last year. I'm, I'll bring a scented candle. How about there, that? That'll, I'm sure everybody will enjoy that. Uh, that. That'll hide your musk as it is. So that's you should be, <laughs> do that anyway, I think, as far as I'm concerned. Um, all right. Let's see. I think that about does it. Let's get out of here. Uh, Kevin, uh, if you're looking for Mr. Kevin Baxter on Twitter, it's at KBaxter11. Uh, head on over to LATimes.com for all of Kevin's wonderful, wonderful articles. Make sure you check it out. Uh, some good stuff on the Chicharito one. Um, so make sure you uh, you go check it out. All right. If you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at Jay Guessman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N. And of course, at Galaxy Podcast. Head on over to cornerthegalaxy.com where you can find all of our articles. All of our written stuff is right there for you. Cornerthegalaxy.com. We are back on Thursday night with a live show. All right. Uh, I think that about does it for Josh Pato Guessman. That's right. Pato Guessman. You're Mr. Kevin Panda Baxter. Uh, you've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.